Today we're going to unravel a mystery that has intrigued us all. The identity behind the Twitter account at AgingDoc1. A Twitter account that shares different media, whether it's publications or news articles, or even sometimes my videos, around the field of ageing research, with a secondary mission of advancing public awareness of the value of jury science and health ban promoting research and its translation. I hope you enjoyed this fun episode. Hey, hey fellow cheeky scientists. <laughs> Hi David, um, or Aging Talk One, I should say, welcome. Yes, I'm imagining with your uh, uh, prowess, with your illustrations, like you're taking illustrations, like taking a mask off me, it's like, aha, and then having <laughs> some kind of a face there. Yes, um, you've finally been revealed. Great to be here. I'm, I'm a huge fan of your work. I think you do your incredible credit to uh, the responsible science communication, and it's also just a lot of fun. So I think it's getting a lot of people interested in both geroscience specifically and also more broadly the biological sciences and research and health sciences. So kudos to you. It's, it's your, like, there's a generation that will remember the Shiki science show and hopefully multiple generations <laughs> are so interested in continuing. But no, thank you so much. And also, I mean, thank, thanks for the platform you've created on Twitter as well. I mean, a lot of the times the videos I create have come from papers that I've seen you share on Twitter. So <clears throat> it goes both ways. And also you've been a, a massive promoter of my, my work on Twitter, which has also helped my platform to grow. Not so. an official promoter. Eleanor never asked <laughs> me to, just for the record. We have no, no, no uh, relationship. And this is actually my first time meeting Eleanor on camera. And Eleanor doesn't even know my name yet. She knows my face, which she just picked <laughs> up literally moments ago. She saw my face. And uh, now you are too. And I'm only going to release, she's only going to release this video after the big, the big announcement. And I can give some explanation about that. Yeah, maybe. Exactly. So I feel like myself and the rest of my audience are probably going to have the same first question, which is, who exactly are you? OK. <laughs> I'm actually going to start by revealing my name, and I, I very, you know, I, I put some thought into everything I do, so deliberately, Eleanor, I didn't reveal my name until, so they're literally live, live the name, uh, so the questions are broader, uh, and basically, my name is the hybrid of two different famous geroscientists. There's David Sinclair, everybody knows, and everybody knows near Barzillai, too, and I am David Barzillai, no relation to either. Um, uh, although, um, yeah, they, they're both, uh, uh, you know, it's, I'm, I'm honored that they're both, uh, at least as at the time of this film, filming f followers of my, uh, my station, but uh, it's, uh, yeah, so I'm David Barzilai. That's the short version, but who is David Barzilai? Shall I elaborate? Of course, yes. Okay, okay. Um, so basically, I first got interested in the, the in, science from a very young age. I, I love like math and science were my favorite subjects. I totally geeked out of them. I would just spend hours on the stacks of the, the, the library and I would enjoy like studying nature outside and things like that. And then sometime later, I would say by the time I got to high school, I was middle school, high school, I was thinking like, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do for a career? And Basically, I thought I love helping the world. I read uh, still the most influential book in my life to date is Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People because um, uh, my greatest passion is uh, kind of self-improvement and finding ways to do cool things in the world that, that help people. And um, the, the science and biological sciences are my other passion. I thought, hey, maybe as a doctor I could do both like I would always be applying science and be challenged and then I would be able to help people one-on-one -on -one, which is always I enjoy that one-on-one -on -one thing like like in large groups I'm like I'm a total introvert I'm like in the corner I'm the guy in the party it's like uh, like watching everybody dance meekly at least historically I've had a little bit of a <laughs> renaissance over the decades which is a whole nother story but uh, basically I volunteered uh, it in a um, in an emergency room, and I thought that was cool. And I also had really bad asthma. That was another influence for me. That I, I thought a lot of doctors, ironically, is I thought a lot of doctors were really terrible. <laughs> and I thought, 
I should be able to do better than this. Like, it just, I mean, they were, I, I, God bless them. I'm so grateful to modern medicine. And there were so many great doctors that I met. But I, I guess I just mean as a patient. The patient experience really stunk. Like an emerg in the middle of the room being rushed to an emergency room and like no control over the flow of a visit, what's happening, and not knowing what's happening and not being able to effectively ask questions. So uh, those things like, I, but I realized how important medicine was to literally saving my life because I had really severe asthma. So all those things brought me to decide on medicine, which in turn uh, made me apply to a particular college, the University of Rochester, that subscribed very much to the biopsychosocial medical model. And that's basically one where, hey, you know what? The science is great, the Flexner report and this, Wissenschaft, this high precision, rigorous science that's laboratory based on one side. But on the other hand, biopsychosocial medicine says we're also embedded in a social fabric where the community and our relationships and uh, the, our, our psychology, all these things lead to uh, contribute to health and, and, and uh, that and social medicine. So all those things made me think UFR would be compatible and that led me to go to college, my next step. So I'm trying to pause here, Shiki, because uh, I, I sort of reviewed my history before, before this, and it's kind of a weird thing. Someone who's like very much a studier, like super duper type A, super analyst, and I'm like going through the archives because I keep everything. I don't throw anything out. Like I, I was finding like back in college, I was already uh, interested in caloric restriction. I wrote to Richard Weindrock, one of the pioneers of caloric restriction. This is an email I saved from 1996. So, um. yeah, I, I mean, I, w I did the, this was like in er early days. I actually helped um, bring the uh, internet to my school in 1993 in high school, uh, in which uh, in high school, like there wasn't, a, there was very primitive web, it was like art, uh, Veronica, Gopher, all these weird protocols that nobody knows anything anything about any, anymore, and 1,200 baud modems going <laughs> connecting, and, and like I was thinking, so um, anyway, I wanted to transition to college where basically in between, I wasn't yet sure, I thought I was pre-med, but I really loved science and technology, What it, my helping the teachers like br uh, use the internet to communicate with other schools, which was all like text-based, what we were doing. Uh, that led me to be, uh, in a small panel, the global classroom youth panel for the World Future Society. So in this great Futurist so uh, Society meeting, I was one of a few high school students. Almost read, uh, met Al Gore uh, there. He had to cancel last minute, but it was a surprise, because you know people like him don't announce. They'll just kind of show up <laughs> or not. Um, but he, he, he ended up <laughs> doing something else and writing to us. But uh, so anyway, that, that led up to college. I'll uh, pause here. OK, well, <clears throat> and so uh, you obviously had a lot of interest in different areas of science. And so um, when you were doing the medicine uh, studies, was there specific parts that you found more interesting than others? Or did you specialize at any point? OK, so um, the, basically, when I was in college, I wasn't, uh, which was like the next stage of my degree. I got all my degrees are in twos. I have two bachelor's degrees. I have two master's degrees. I have two doctorates, and I have wow. two board certifications. One of them is a kind of a pseudo board certification. Uh, but I'll I'll answer your question first, and then perhaps uh, unpack college a little bit. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, long story short, I'm actually. I don't practice longevity medicine as a physician, though one of the th reasons that I'm, I'm coming out publicly in a desire to make more impact is I thought it'd be really cool if I could be a health coach and consultant in the area of longevity medicine without actually writing prescriptions or, or anything like that. So it wouldn't be under my medical license, but just more like, a, um, you know, my wife has this joke sometimes that we go to places and health comes up and then more and more people demonstrate interest because I give detailed answers and 
she says I should just do an, start a show called Ask Dave or something. <laughs> so I thought to myself, I do enjoy that, and um, wouldn't it be cool if I, you know, I had, in addition to what I practice in, that I am able to coach and consult in the area of longevity without actually, you know, writing prescriptions or giving an official medical advice, but rather as an expert uh, uh, colleague and as a life, life coach too. I, I, I enjoy just helping people in general. Anyway, so uh, in, in answer to your question, I'm, a, I'm actually a board certified dermatologist. And one of the nice things about, about dermatology is that um, I find it fun that you could just walk into a room and the other doctors didn't know what it is. Nobody knows what it is. You take one look and you know the diagnosis. You just see it. That pattern recognition is cool. I also like that I could treat people a very diverse population, you know, men as well as women, older as well as younger. I also, I've always had very eclectic intellectual interests, like all over the place, and I like taking deep dives. And if I chose, for example, to be a surgeon or even internal medicine, you're a little out of, oh, you're there, okay. Um, I don't know if that's my camera or yours. Um, that's my dermatologist detail orientation fix. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, um, and what I liked is that there was a good work-life balance too. It's a stable job, extremely high demand. When I applied, I don't know how it is now, but it was, it was definitely the top three, maybe the number one most competitive uh, subspecialty to get into. And one reason for that is uh, not just the skin is an amazing organ; it's the largest organ in the body. Although that's kind of been drawn into question. With, a lot of people go into it just because for the simple fact is if you want to have a balance between uh, personal life and your work or just different interests, then dermatology lends itself much better to work-life balance. And um, in the, I work part-time as a dermatologist for complex reasons, but part of it is this, it's like, part of it is like my family. It gives me more time for my family because they have a, uh, we have a wonderful uh, son who is uh, twice exceptional, so he's absolutely brilliant. Like Mensa is the top three percent of IQ, and he got tested, wow. and he's a Davidson scholar, which puts him in the top tenth of one percent in IQ. Uh, so uh, he's really, really bright. And the other exceptional is he's neurodivergent; he just kind of thinks differently. And you know, we all matured. He's he's 17 now, and I'm sure he's going to listen to this one day. So uh, Adam, I love you, and, and I love your, your neurodiversity. Um, and uh, sometimes the school systems don't perfectly align with, uh, with people who are uh, diverse in the way they think. And so that takes some time also. And I also ch uh, chose to work part-time so I could pursue my own learning and helping my family and this personal project and my own sense of life being very finite and uh, at my age there's so much I want to conquer this lifetime so um, so anyway that's dermatology Eleanor in answer to your question and uh, the other uh, board certification they board people who are already practicing physicians for something that's called lifestyle medicine so it's uh, an exam I, I, I prepared for they had a curriculum and I studied and different specialties can sit for it. And I, I, I sat for and passed their exam in Florida. So I'm also licensed by the American Board of Lifestyle Medicine. Uh, so I'm a diplomat of the American Board of Lifestyle Medicine, which is things like you know, getting good sleep, reducing stress, exercise, diet, all these things which are like the other non-biogerontology uh, slash geroscience things that I tend to focus on your general health span. Uh, but I don't do that medically. I just apply to my family. <laughs> I pursued this, uh, and that was something else that lent myself to. You know, I'm so confining myself by being an anonymous. If I did coaching and consulting, maybe I can help some people because there, I, I go so deep in those areas, and I have you know certified it, and I'm just not using it and sitting on it. So that's kind of like the the medicine track. Uh, but I'll pause here for your 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 questions um, before going back, taking a step back, probably to col college. I'm thinking. Yeah, I mean, firstly, that's in in super impressive. Um, I'm intrigued uh, that you've got such the the lifestyle. Um, was that so? That was more recently that you acquired um, that board membership. 
Yes, I, uh, more recent things I've gone, uh, which I can cover more later, are uh, an MBA. Um, very proud that as someone who was not for, uh, like I studied uh, the, on my own, I read the Certified Financial Planning, their official textbook for one of their exams, and I read almost every section of their textbook, except for a few areas like estate planning or certain business entities. So I love reading textbooks anyway, so I, I'm kind of a serial degree getter, even if I don't plan on using the degree directly, just if I find it cool and fun and potentially applicable. Like, I was the first <laughs> physician in my family, unless you count a, a distant family relative like my grandfather's cousin uh, was one of the two awardees of the Nobel Prize in, in Physiology and Medicine in 1922, Odo Meyerhoff, but he's really remote. Um, and so I have this huge debt, and I had no, <laughs> and I was just starting, I was like, gee, I, maybe I should know more about finances. So that, then I did all this reading on the CFP stuff, and then after I felt like I, I mastered the like certified financial planning type stuff for life planning. In fact, well, wasn't an MBA useful? Because at the time, I was one of the uh, partners in a large group practice. I was uh, working full time, and we rotated in and out of uh, managing the partnership, and I thought an MBA would be useful for that too. So I built on on some of the skills like learning time value of money projections uh, to a much more globally like running a business, and I did that from um, UMass Amherst. Uh, they had a hybrid program, so that's just an example. So that's another example of a more recent degree after my medical degree. Another is an MS in in psychology. Um, the MBA, I was proud though I, I, I got the, the di both their award societies, whatever their names are, and I a 4.0 GPO, GPA, excuse me. <laughs> I, I can I get a 4.0 <laughs> GPA, but apparently I, I can't uh, get the acronym for grade point average right. <laughs> um, but um, so yeah, I, I've always loved to learn uh, Eleanor, and that's what led to a lot of these, these uh, adventures, including the the college which I can take us to when. Oh great, I mean I definitely share that uh, passion for learning, always trying to read as much as I can and I'm actually somewhat jealous of the fact you've had the chance to uh, do all these different degrees. So have we covered all of them? Oh, we well, need to know. Uh, uh, well I think that the bachelor's degrees are actually relevant, I thought it would be fun like for the uh, for the bachelor's, so I said I get everything everything in twos I have this left side of my brain that's very logical and this right side that's very expansive and creative and um, and they've always kind of been at war with one another but sometimes creating harmony with one another. So to satisfy that in college I got a BA in health and society which is extremely broad. It was highly influenced by my advisor Ted Brown who ended up becoming chairman of the Department of History and Medicine in the division of, um, and also he had an affiliation with the medical school in the division of, of the medical humanities. And it, it, health and society is like everything. It's like public health, it's like medical sociology, ethics in medicine, and me it's uh, uh, anthropology of medicine, it's like health policy about uh, public health, you name it, everything like health, it's like population health. and. So it's cool, it's very broad picture, like how to help general populations. Um, so that's that, and the, the other deg the degree I got was a BS in, uh, in cell and developmental biology, so I wanted to do more than just a BA, which was broad, but to really specialize, and cell and developmental biology gave me a broad background, but let me really specialize. It was hard because it wasn't just, you can apparently get overlapping courses if it's called getting a double major, but doing a double degree is different. That means they don't allow the same amount of overlap. They make it harder for some reason because you're officially, they get reimbursed less. It's something weird. Like they're giving me two official certificates instead of a joint one. So anyway, so um, that was a lot of fun. And actually some of my hardest working years were, were in, in, in college. I, I graduated um, uh, summa cum laude, Phi Beta Kappa, 3.92 GPA, which I'm very proud of because I, in some ways more than some of the other cops, because I worked so hard. I was pre-med, I was doing everything. Um, uh, anyway, but that's where I met my, my, my wife, which, which was a whole other left and right brain thing, which probably would make it more a, a little colorful if I added that to the narrative, if that fits. 
Of course, yeah. I mean, uh, I think, I mean, I look back fondly on my undergrad days and realize how hard I actually worked then. And I know I still do work hard, but I don't think it quite matches the intensity you get when you find a subject that you really want to learn about. It was crazy. It's double. It's, it's like I'm a perfectionist, I'm like detail oriented. And then on top of that, I was sort of obsessed with getting into medical school. It's funny, <laughs> like um, there's someone famous on Twitter uh, has more, more followers than me. He has no idea that he was my TA in 1993, 1993, Harmit Malik, nicest, smartest TA I ever met. He was only like a, like a year or two older than me, he was a graduate student, and I must have seemed like such a nutcase to him because I, they required like one teaching session to go to, but me being obsessive, I went to to both of them, and I was the one that sat front, to, I raised my hand. It was fun at graduation because I had no idea that I kind of became pseudo famous in some of the pre-med classes. Like I was an introvert, I didn't talk to anyone. So, but I would always be the front center, like <laughs> raise my hand, ask, ask the question, uh, and uh, for, for better or worse. But um, anyway, so um, in terms of the left and the right brain and the connection to, to my wife, uh, the, and um, it's interesting because in college it's really where my first exposure was to geroscience. I mentioned I, I wrote to uh, Richard Weindrock with the caloric restriction, but actually this is a good segue also to um, meeting my wife because I think there's a quote that, that's appropriate to meeting my wife that is uh, slightly entertaining that relates also to geroscience. And, okay, so um, I was polled like uh, the campus, there was Campus Times, our newspaper, and they actually had a kind of geoscience longevity themed question. The question was, if you could be reincarnated as whatever you want, what would you be? And they had like six people, and I was like, ooh, ooh. this is a <laughs> little bit after I met her, and this is David Barr's life, take five skull. I didn't mention, like I, one of the harder things in college was combining two programs. One was to have a tuition-free fifth year that the college pays for for another area of education. Another was to get like an honors the the thesis. Uh, so one was called Take Five and the other was called Senior Scholars. So I met with both heads and I was the first person to like envision combining the two. So I did an honors thesis in healthcare policy for my tuition-free fifth year. Plus it gave me extra time for get it, you know getting to know my soon wife to be. I was she was my first and was always will be my first. And uh, so what I wrote to her, being the corny person that I am, so the question is, if you could be reincarnated as whatever you want, what would you be? And I wrote myself, because outside, um, because I consider myself, if the lighting isn't great here, uh, <laughs> because I consider myself the luckiest man in the world to, to know, uh, to, uh, know such a, a perfect girlfriend or have such a perfect girlfriend. So that's what I wrote and that, this is what I look like in 1993 above this year. Yeah, very yeah, different here as you can see. <laughs> wow. Anyway, um, so the story uh, actually, and, at the, and I was very much into longevity then. It w wasn't just CR, but I did kind of practice many CR then which later, during a later stage, it's a whole story we won't have time for where I did like real hardcore CR practitioner myself and I only practice CR light these days for a variety of complex reasons that I feel are optimized. But at the time I read Gene Carper's uh, uh, Fight Aging or something like that, um, uh, Fight Aging Now or Stop Aging Now and um, that was influential but my wife what, uh, I noticed her in the dining center long before I met her. Uh, Kathy's her name. Uh, and I noticed there's a woman, she had this beautif beautiful, uh, big Italian eyes. But what really caught my attention is she was always laughing and she had this big smile and she was laughing and she was like egregarious and like my social opposite. She was like a real social butterfly and she'd always be in that dining center other table. And she also wore glasses. So I thought, you know, to stereotype, I, you know, maybe she's, She's smart, like I like, you know, like intelligent, the two thi more, most attractive quality to me in, in, in individuals then and, and now are their, in, their intelligence and their character. And um, so basically I said to myself at the time, if I ever have the opportunity 
I, I have to meet this woman. I have to meet her. And I think to myself, I'm, you know, and I, this was at a time where I said to myself, I was past the stage where I was like, I can't date. I'm not doing anything. I worked so hard that I literally exasperated a colleague who, in, uh, co uh, a friend who constantly at invited me to parties Friday night and every time I was like, I'm sorry, I have a study, uh, uh, an exam on Monday and I can't study. I said, it's Friday night. <coughs> and, and this is, <laughs> feel free to cut it if it's not, not like uh, appropriate, but I, 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 I he said it in, in good spirit because he, he had friends like this. But finally one day he was so frustrated. He was like, what's the matter with you? What's the matter with you? You study harder than my Indian friends or something. So it's like the weirdest compliment that I ever got <laughs> was, was that. Uh, but anyway, back to my, my wife. So I said to my, that was now at a point where I d was a well enough track that I knew I would do well and I would, uh, as well as I can predict, pass the bars to get into uh, medical school, uh, that I said to myself, okay, if I meet this, this, this young lady, I got to do it, but I have a big problem. I've never dated anyone. I'm a total social introvert. How the heck am I going to do this? So then I came up with a, a secret plot. This is my secret <laughs> plot, okay? So I'm a very determined individual. Like before we had a Neo from the, the Matrix, I'm imagining you're superimposing my face with I am Neo with the glasses to scene. That was such a powerful movie for me because I literally, when I was studying, I would study like for a double digit hours timed. If someone stopped to talk to me, I went to the bathroom, I would stop the watch and I would time it. Oh. So I do like a good, uh, you know, 12 plus hours of studying consistently um, a day. Anyway, so um, I, I said to myself, I am David Barzilai. So that was kind of like, I am Neo before the movie. I am David Barzilai and I, was, I am a machine. So I was, I am so determined. I have to figure out a way where an introvert who's very left brain can do something very right brain. And I came up with a solution. I even thought about maybe writing a book about it one day. <laughs> But this is, the, this is the idea I came up with, Eleanor. I said, okay, the analysts and me will be good at following directions. I just need to have the right side of my brain give the left side of my brain a task. And if, it, if the right side of the brain gives a task, even if it's a social one, the left brain says, yes, master. <laughs> I'll be analytic, I'll be precise, I will follow it to a T. So I had my right brain say to myself, I say, if you meet this woman again, Okay, if you meet Kathy, or I didn't know it's her name, if you meet her, you have to talk to her, assignment one, and the second assignment, you have to, at the end of that conversation, no matter how it goes, no matter how embarrassing it is, no matter how destined you are to failure, you have to ask for her phone number. And you know what? You can feel good about that, because what's going to happen is she's, uh, is she's going to say, that's okay, or, you know, or like, you know, why, why don't, you, you know, she's not going to give me her number. She's going to be polite and say something like that. Why don't I take your number? And I'll be like, okay, pressure's off. And I'll be happy either way. So that's what I did. And basically it was at a wedding shower. Uh, and I, I saw her across. I was like, oh my God, she's here. I have to do this assignment. <laughs> okay. I say, I am David Barzilai. David Barzilai can do anything. I am a machine. I am David Barzilai. So I, I do that to myself. And I, so I walk up to her. And it's funny. Like, I'm extremely, like, you can tell I'm an intense guy. So imagine an intense guy in a mission with the adrenaline. So I'm like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so I, I walk up to her, you know. But I'm very sincere. People can usually tell that I'm, I'm a really, like, I'm a, emotions on the surface. I'm very passionate, but I'm very on the surface, I don't hide, I, I, I am who I am. So we have this conversation that's kind of exciting, engaged, it kind of goes okay. And the end of it, Eleanor, I, I uh, basically, I, it's that moment and I ask her for her phone number and as expected, she didn't give her phone number and she was like, I uh, said, why don't I, you know, why don't I take, take your number? And she did it so, such a nice, graceful way it's like, oh. first of all, I'm like so, like already, I'm so enamorated with her already. And rather than feeling, uh, you know, rejected, I think to myself, oh, and she's got such a nice heart. She doesn't want to hurt my feelings. She's, you know, she's just making up an excuse. So little did I, little did I know, like uh, apparently 
after that conversation we had, this, we shared stories there, she was like thinking about me like, uh, so what ended up happening is she le left a message on my, my machine and, and, and my answering machine and to this date, I, I had it recorded and I like wrote down either that or another event and I actually typed it up, actually typed the chronicles of our meeting. It was like a 50 page document, some, something ridiculous like that of like the chronicles of my, my first relationship. Unpublished and under lock and seal, never to be seen <laughs> by public. But that's just the type of person I am. To, so anyway, I documented what she wrote, and but she met me as a friend. And uh, long story short, one of the things I recorded is um, I, I was very surprised that one day after I already was in, invited by one friend, like a female friend of mine, to accompany her to the Viennese Ball, uh, she left a message to say, like, to invite me to the Viennese ball. <laughs> so then I had like a dilemma because I had a friend that's female and I had this woman that I was extremely nominated with. Um, so I asked permission from the first first girl and I asked, said, I'm in the, who was a friend, and it was a clear, it was a friendship. I said, I want to show you a good time and I have these feelings for this this other person. I wonder, is it possible in some way that I could go to the ball with both of you, but I would only do it with both of your, with, with your permission, and I would tell her. And she said, she said sure, so that was, uh, it was, it was like, it was like, what, almost like one of those movies, except both knew about each other, and I think I kind of managed to show them both good, good times and have to good times with both of them, but that's, that's my, the saga, the, you know, my, my Kathy, my Kathy stories and uh, my left brain, right brain. So, and that was kind of, kind of college where it wrapped up. Where uh, one of my proudest moments in college was the graduation ceremony for the BA in Health and Society. Where my my I'm kind of more proud of the little certificate from that than I am of everything else because it had my name in like in every almost every category like honors thesis and like like. Uh, highest honors and you know different random categories and I was very that that felt really good and I have always been but I want to make clear I, it's making a difference that's really the biggest driver but anyway feel cut all that out that's that's a lot of, I I would love that over, <laughs> but but I just read this stuff again so like I have all these images of myself in college and you have this adventure where you're discovering science you're you're discovering yourself and now I'm in a sort of re-emergence re of that because when I turned 49, I made a promise to myself, so you know what, this year I'm going to do something totally different. Like symbolically, it's like between now and when I turn 50. So that secret project, Project 49, ended up being like, my God, people will discover my identity if I decide to coach and consult the longevity. So I need to come out. And if I need to come out, hey, wait a minute, if I come out, Maybe I can make more of a difference. Maybe I could be on a pod, podcast, or maybe I could interview people at a much more sophisticated level than most of the science communication out there, with the exception of Eleanor Cheeky. You guys better <laughs> subscribe. I do. <laughs> anyway. Well, yeah, Farsi, thank you for sharing all of that. Um, it was lovely to hear, and also just to understand you better. I think it, it was very obvious to myself um, to have a better understanding of your backgrounds and your personality and I think um, I hope my audience also appreciate that and I now that you've mentioned it a few times and I was super curious as to how uh, the Twitter side started and how your um, aging talk one began and how that yes. fits in with your timeline yes good question so in between I got my PhD in health services research um, that was a fun time where I, 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 I basically I, I had the, the privilege of working with not one, but several of either committee members or close advisors like Kurt Stange, who ended up being like head of a family medicine journal, was considering family medicine at the time. Uh, he was Institute of Medicine. Duncan Neuhauser was on my PhD committee. He was Institute of Medicine and like, a, and like maybe, maybe a third. I'll have. But uh, basically during my PhD years, I settled on, on a melanoma uh, health services research, and I, I, I it like in just a, like couple, only like uh, two or like only a few years, I got like maybe up to around a dozen 
peer-reviewed publications. So I was working like a <laughs> very hard then, um, working, collaborating with different people. But one of the cool things about that is I, I, I got to, as while well, I was still just a, a, uh, a medical school student in my MD, PhD, I developed a, a I started an evidence-based medicine site. I, and I taught evidence-based medicine to der dermatologists and, and was kind of their faculty as a medical student for the dermatology for those sessions where I wrote the curriculum and delivered it. So that was really cool. Um, but what, so that's all in the backdrop of, I, I mentioned already the lifestyle medicine. I'm giving the evidence-based medicine background as context and within the context of the PhD, which was, um, uh, we were the first class to do the dual degree program and I got to meet the Surgeon General at the time and had fun there. Anyway, I got to, uh, then I thought it would be cool if in Twitter I could apply some of what I have from my PhD and interest in lifestyle medicine and I can also apply some of the geroscience where I've been personally obsessed with uh, <laughs> long my personal longevity and health span my whole, my whole life. Uh, like I have very elaborate optimization routines which are n I don't discuss, <laughs> uh, I discuss really minimally um, but uh, because it's a lot of it is pre-cutting edge, it's not quite evidence-based medicine, it's more evidence-guided medicine, best bet medicine and always evolving. So I thought, hey, wouldn't it be cool, I have this extremely elaborate universe where I can dig so deep uh, Eleanor in the literature, some broader view, having not having a lab that I need to supervise people and students and grants and all these things, and I can devote 100% of that part-time effort to just learning geroscience, just learning, 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 learning. It's just such a depth of knowledge that it just seems silly that I just keep it for myself and my family. So I thought, well low-lying fruit is I'm doing these deep literature searches for myself anyway, uh, as someone very interested in the space. And I, I can make an impact just by bringing in knowledge in one space uh, for good debate and discussion, and also to reveal all the bad geoscience hype and media out there to people who know better, so that though my role, and I don't have the, the time and it would conflict with other missions such as inclusiveness, to in, in a broad number of people de debating and discussing so as many people can come together, not just those who are more evidence-based, um, that I'm able to um, basically put that all in under one roof. So sorry to wind that uh, up again, I'm saying I thought that I could, low-lying fruit is to bring all that knowledge in one, one, one space where people can know what's what's good and what's bad and so out there and so that people can have healthy uh, debates and bring in the science and for not to be full of hype and for not to be like one narrow research lab that focuses on the stuff they're excited about and less about the stuff they're less excited about or even things that they might have a conflict with and maybe a conflict of interest with. Like uh, for me, um, when I did this and I was anonymous, I had like no no conflicts, because you can even learn about me, you know what I mean? Like, you, I wouldn't shouldn't say no, there are always some, because like to, like to, for people to learn about it, like maybe ego or something like that, for people to learn about you, or you're making a difference, or whatever. Uh, so I guess those are kinds of conflicts, but I didn't even have anything to sell, nobody could even find me, because they didn't know who I was. Because some people say I have, I have no conflicts, but they have a service that they have, that it costs, like, not that that's bad, you know, and, and now I'm kind of, in that in the role where I'm doing coaching and consulting for a very small number of people, so it's not meant for your general view viewership. Sorry, I only have a few hours a week, so it's it's kind of concierge type that only is suitable for a few people out there. Sorry, uh, but I won't give up. I won't abandon you, Twitter people. I I, I care, and I'm I'm not going to give. Up. In fact, this uh, the coming out because of that thing, which is only applies to a tiny segment of people lets me be public, which in turn means I can do even more, like to be on with, with Eleanor. So that's what brought me to, that's what brought me to, to Twitter originally, this idea if I can make an impact in these ways. Wow, yeah, and I think um, with Twitter itself, I mean, obviously the platform has changed over time and personally, I didn't, I think at some points when I've been uh, following your Twitter feeds, there was times where I just assumed it was a bot with all these papers coming out daily, but Many obviously that's, 
not the, not the case, but so how has your presence on Twitter evolved over time? Did you find that your style changed or like if you remember the very early days when you originally started the, the account, did it, uh, yeah, how has it changed over time? That's a really good question. When I came to, I, all of my decisions in life are multi, multifactorial. Usually, usually when people ask why you did X, and they say did X because of Y, and I tend to think of maybe because of my rigorous biostat background or my, my interest in evidence-based medicine and clinical decision-making, which has a quant uh, uh, background, as does modeling, which I did a little bit of modeling in my PhD, too, for one of my courses. All those things make me think in terms of a multivariate uh, equation, in terms of all the variables that go into making decisions. So um, w how have, so that multivariate equation is always optimized towards doing good and ha having having the most positive impact while having the most fulfillment and and, and positive in, in in you know my life experience and sharing that with others. So that how that's optimized varies over time. So when I came onto Twitter, part of that polyvariate equation was I described, but. I, any, every answer I give, every single answer I've given to something you've asked me today, and anything in life, it's like just one element of something I, I, that I usually think about more broadly. So I thought about, I can learn new skills. I enjoy learning new skills. These skills could be, it could be useful. I, I don't want to ever be antiquated. And if I'm a believer in longevity, that means being able to be a contributor to society your entire lifespan. And, for you to, and isn't it cool to be able to grow and thrive? So. Part of my goal was just to learn the platform. And as I learned the platform, I was also learning social media. Like, it's like a lot of crazy <laughs> craziness out there, a lot of hype. Um, something that I'm very proud of, that I have like p very strong beliefs at opposite ends of the spectrum or follow me. There are people who have massive followers follow me and that are uh, opposite ends of the extreme. Uh, whether it, uh, it's like uh, whether it's a strict ethical vegan or a carnivore, so they'll they'll have it at it, and I have my own take, which I'm kind of I try to be a moderator of good dialogue, you know. So part of what I've gotten better at, what's is I think I've gotten better at figuring out Eleanor, the balance of what started with me just off the cuff experiencing and just wandering around them like a virtual nomad going to places asking people questions or making say here's an opportunity for me to make an intellectual contribution and so I I give an idea which I think is helpful to the research out there I think a lot of what I learned is that and what that multivariate model that I have that is optimizing continues to be optimized at good but how that looks continues to evolve and I struggle as issues come up, Eleanor, like controversies come up. I'm like, should I ignore it? Is it a distraction? Am I ca ca getting myself caught up in, in a hype that is more alienating and counterproductive, uh, where it should be served in other purposes? Or am I abrogating my responsibility here? Should I be speaking more uh, directly here in terms of this? And how do I do more, most good? And how do I... And I think people, even when they're in opposite poles of a view, most people are good and reasonable. They just have different paradigms. So I try more to foster evidence to be the guide post, post and to ha assume people are good at heart. And that if someone's bad at heart, you can't make them good, even if that was. But I, re I really believe that, that uh, in the geroscience community in particular, People really mean well, and they, they, if someone is more optimistic about the notion of uh, a time frame for longevity, doing good in the good, doing good in the world, and being optimistic, they believe that in their heart of hearts, and they're more of a, a, a futurist or a transhumanist. And there are other people who are more conservative scientists. Say, well, we haven't even extended a mouse mouse lifespan more than you know. <laughs> so we're talking about doing it in humans, and how can we extrapolate? And what's responsible messaging? Will we not be trusted if we overpromise, or are we not trusted because we're not promising enough? Because nobody believes us? Because we're not refusing to make any any sort of project forward projections at all? So the the biggest things that have changed, changed, and evolved, is not so much the content, but my conception. And um, but the other thing is I've gotten far more sophisticated at 
chat aging doc one. <laughs> I proceeded chat GPT. So, uh, you know, I can have intellectual credit for having my post precede that, unless I'm really the super top secret thing that's even before <laughs> chat GPT, but is smarter than it um, and hopefully wiser and without, with a minimal amount of hallucinations. <laughs> um, so, but the other thing is uh, the, I, I get, have an extremely eclectic pool from which I pull uh, data. So it, it, it's not like a simple PubMed s search can do it. A PubMed search can be far more comprehensive, uh, but it still at the same time miss the, my broad eclectic passion interest that make things fun and interest. Um, and it could be oh, those literatures can be too broad, or you can have things like uh, the aging biology, an example of uh, and highlights in aging, which are both fantastic t Twitter feeds, all extremely high quality. But if you subscribe only to those and not to me, I think there are important things that are also missed in terms of uh, whether it's uh, even am amongst the universe of high quality things, less to follow the much larger widespread. It's like this is crappy research, you should probably know it, so because this is what people are talking about, tell the followers about it, tell the media about it, uh, bust the hype, or have a good discussion, because maybe you disagree, but maybe they're right, or vice versa, and maybe the truth is somewhere in between, and there needs to be a good discussion about it. So I, I'm, I'm proud of being a unifier with, um, that through all this time I have succeeded in not alienating even within the geoscience community. For the most part, there are like kind of pseudo exceptions, but that people continue to quote content and, and use it as a leverage point for them to be discussing their point. Even if they're making opposite points, they're citing the literature that I helped them identify. Exactly. Um, and but you made me think of several follow-up questions, and now I'm thinking which one's best to ask. Um, <laughs> Well, Shoot firstly, away. I think what makes your Twitter stand out from just like as bots is you also share videos. And occasionally I see that if you've shared one of my videos, it's not just the like standard YouTube link. It's like got a screenshot or somewhere in the video suggesting that you, you do actually watch it, which is my second point was um, when it comes to the, the articles you share on Twitter, have you how much have you read or are these things that you share and you've maybe read the abstract or like how in detail do you get the chance to actually read? Um, no, if, do you, might need if, you, if you do the math and you add up the seconds and you take an average reading rate, it would be impossible to do a, you know, there are different formats of read. There's a skim, study, and scan. So I, I the, for people who've taken speed reading classes, uh, you can sort of adjust your rate. And there's some science to it. I mean, some of it is a little bit gimmicky, but some of it can work to a degree in terms of eye movement for speed reading. But even, even at a, a fast clip, you, you can't go through it all. So the level of which I go for reading is um, w w I basically use this, uh, the, the similar sort of paradigm that uh, Einstein thinks uh, about a good uh, theory. A good uh, theory, I try to have an optimization function for the content I read. And I optimize it with two targets. One target is for interest for the audience, and another target is interest for myself. If something's interesting for the audience, um, unless I think it's harmful, if I think it's, mission, it's appropriate to the mission and helpful, even if it's like really, you know, like a lot of the media, the media pieces, okay? It's like that, a lot of that's, just, that's not a detailed read. On the other hand, uh, if you have uh, you know a new research coming out of the like a, a major a major lab hundred labs maybe that they have higher quality work and uh, they're more relevant pieces to translation I tend to do more study read so if, it, if it's applicable to something that's actionable to my own my own life uh, or it's anything related to health span longevity or it's just more interesting to me or if I feel that reading more deeply lends itself to something uh, making a decision whether or not to post it those things all are variables it's very much i see myself as a sort of curator i'm hard to reproduce because there's a lot of art to it and there's a lot of art to how deeply i read you know i, I can read papers extremely efficiently for the level needed to answer the question i want to 
but others. So it, it all depends on, on what, on the paper, I guess. So I can't give you an algorithm, you know, <laughs> because chat GPT just can't be replicated. You know, you would have to literally capture my lifetime by that, that bot and every aspect of it, every variable, every, the, mol the molecules in my brain, and then, then they could kind of use that as a model to create one. But um, yeah, that's, that's, my, that, that's the method to my madness. Mm, yeah, I see. And obviously, like now you've been on Twitter over 10 years, am I right with that? Over 10 years? No, that's something I'm very proud of, that I've been only on, on Twitter since, you can fact check me that on this now, but I want to say just since, uh, since, two, since about 2020, so only about three years or Oh, wow, or so. okay, wow. And what's, what, what I find amazing is when I went onto Twitter, I remember when I had my first follower I was like I was really excited and then when I got to 10 I was like wow there are 10 people because the first people that followed me tended to be people who are had a lot of followers it's like at the uh, at the time to degree now but at the time it's like the only people that followed me with well, a few exceptions here there are people who were like were really really people I respected a lot and had really knew their stuff they had labs they were very sophisticated they were thought leaders and things like that. So I was very proud that I started with zero followers, none on Twitter. And most people come to Twitter who have, who uh, develop a following and certainly following over some period of, uh, of, of time that's relatively quickly. You know, they have a podcast, they have a practice, they have something that, they have a book, they have a blog, they have something where people know about them. Mm. This is a complete stranger, doesn't show his face, and all that stranger does is, one, produce something that might be useful, like publish something interesting that, that just, just that's interesting out there and just picked it. Or two, from time to time, makes a comment that's like, oh, the, this person who posted, they're, they're not an idiot. Or like, oh, well that, that's interesting, huh? Oh, maybe I should follow this person. So just by virtue of that, and the other thing I'm proud of is that, that, that for my 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 followers, which is yeah, you know, more than 10k now in just a few years, and yeah, yeah, yeah you have to look up the number. But that the the, fo the followers I I have it, without resorting to any big gimmicks or any big hype. So you asked about you know pictures and things like that. That was one of your questions. So I, I have learned along the way. You know, there's some such things, thing like A/B testing, where you you try things one way, you try things another way, and you see what garners more followers. And for me, being a natural optimizer, I sort of can't help I help myself. It's like, oh well, this reaches more people. But it's not just optimization for optimization sakes. It's part of my core values. But all those variables, Eleanor, make me want to optimize. But I figure if I make if I have the desire to make an impact then the more people I reach, the more impact I can make. So now I'm slowing myself down, Eleanor, to answer your question. So, <laughs> so what I, if I find that something seems to raise uh, more uh, awareness in a responsible way, that's the key variable, in a responsible way. Responsible. If I could do that in a responsible way, that I would could pursue that. So I noticed people like you know, pictures and things like that. I'm like, so why not? You know, but like, I, I could be, I mean, can I rule out? Will I ever be one of those people that's like one of those things like, you know, this is crazy, this is crazy. <laughs> or like, like, hi, you know, like, and I mean like, Eleanor, I hope you don't use those images against me. <laughs> My God, you have editing power. So you use your, you know, like, the spider, I'm a big geek, like, look, I love quoting, like, geek, geek, geek uh, uh, nerdy science, but, like, with great, great powers comes great responsibility, like, for, from Spider-Man, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like, like, like it's, it's so true, like, you have a lot of responsibility to wield in your communication, but you wield it very responsibly, and that's my point, I try to do so responsibly, too. One of the things that really is upsetting to me on Twitter, and maybe a little bit of Twitter burnout might be a little bit of this, too, like, like, Ah, uh, you know, I'm I'm doing some good here, but ah, uh, there's so much hype out there, and so I, I don't I although I, I I try to be cognizant of reaching an audience like I should be as being responsible to the audience as being able to reach people who might benefit, I try to do so not in this this crazy hypeful way, and in fact that was one of the reasons I created my channel, Eleanor. It was like 
the, the degree to which I saw social media and I didn't follow it too much and I thought if I get a channel maybe I could follow geoscientists and I could pick up these little comments that don't make their way to the publications because I, I want to dig deeper because at the time I was doing detailed reads method sections and everything to the deepest geoscience in the areas I read like reading covered like I, my, my PhD gave me a very strong so I consider myself a geoscientist in the sense that I, my, my knowledge base is, the, is, is, is sufficient in my being a part of this, this space. That's different than having a lab, and anybody that has a lab in an area will uh, run circles around me in terms of the specific methods for, okay, like let's say NAD biology, or you know, like, okay, this, I'll construct this experiment this way, that. But in terms of being able to be a geoscientist in the sense of being a thought leader and having novel ideas to inject to it, I like to have an opportunity to create a space where people can talk about the science and not get caught up in hype and a lot of terrible conflicts of interest, but really can, and can have healthy debates without it being mudslinging or being selective, the evidence presented, but to have a real meeting of minds with a positive pro-science approach, which is you could, be, you could be wrong, I could be wrong, we both could be wrong. <laughs> We both could be right, and probably somewhere in between those, and let's learn from each other in a positive spirit, and let's believe we're both good human beings, and let's in a collegial way, maybe sometimes in a little bit feisty way, and certainly in a, a mentally critical way, say, hey, wait, this, that, that, but let's, let's be amicable and be respectful and colleagues and bring science forward and, and find and line things so we can ultimately reach more patients and make more of a positive impact in the world. Yes, well, I mean, I'm happy to hear that from you. I mean, I think I have a similar approach to this channel. Um, and I think, yeah, one of my sort of more final questions for you was now that, I mean, at the time this video comes out, um, you've now revealed your, um, you've revealed yourself. Um, like, how does that change uh, the future of your Twitter page or how like what sort of challenges do you think you're going to face now or how do you see <clears throat> the next couple of years for you so um i i described the moment before between now and the re reveal when it's still just called project 49 that nobody knows about except you eleanor and just a, just a few others um it's it's um with some excitement and, and tre trepidation simultaneously you learn as a as a as a physician to have thick skin, to a degree. I'm I'm a sensitive soul. I I am always you know, and so I I, but I felt like it would I would not be true to myself, or to others if I could not manifest a potential that I don't know where that it even might lead, and also follow my own belief in as much transparency as is possible, and to to l put that out there, you know? So I, 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 I don't know where that, what that's gonna bring, uh, but I, I'm hoping that by being public that I can be able to have more of an impact in a more global way than the very specific way that led me to the, the whole thing that's Barzilai Consulting that I'm creating. It's barzilaiconsulting.com, and uh, so I'm creating, I'm building that behind the scenes, and it's not up yet. Um, and um, yeah, and I'm having like uh, learning all about web design. Uh, so and, and I'm having a, oh uh, your your viewers should probably know if you are curious. Uh, I'm having agingdoc.com point to it. That's easier. Uh, or in healthspancoaching.com also point to that. Uh, so that's the coaching and the consulting and but that opens up my being able to do other things like potentially do higher order level stuff that assumes the audience already is a geroscientist or is a longevity enthusiast who is sufficiently high in their reading that we don't need to spell out to them what the geroscience hypothesis is. They know the hallmarks of aging by heart. They're very comfortable with l the concept of longevity medicine that you can just go deeper because a lot of researchers, they have an opportunity to talk to colleagues in research conferences, but they only have a few minutes to answer questions at the end of their talk. Their talk focuses usually very narrowly on their latest research, 
but not more globally philosophically on such matters as the direction of our field. Uh, responsible and effective messaging, being effective to being able to translate the basic science of biology of aging to patients. All those things are extremely important, but to what audiences do they have an extended format where these things are, are really articulated? They are a, a bit by some science communicators, but not so much to a, a kind of a more sophisticated audience that really already knows this stuff. Um, and yet it's much more depth in a more broad, big picture, conceptual questions for the field than can be done in a typical conference. So that's kind of some of my thoughts about some areas where I can uniquely contribute to the field. And ultimately, that's what it's all about. I, I want to be able to accelerate this really cool biology, which I'm fascinated by its own, uh, own sake. I think we, that we should heavily uh, fund the basic sciences and not take away from the basic sciences, but only add to it, not remove it and give more to translational, but keep the basic science, expand the, uh, its basic underpinnings so we understand the biology of aging better, and then have an, an additional expansion to help bring it to patients, because that's, that's where the metal, that's where the pedal meets the road, right? The, the, it's, what we really care about is having people live longer lives that are healthier, for people to have, whether or not you're transhumanist or like a futurist type orientation, like, uh, like my, myself, I'm, I'm a kind of see myself as a futurist that is, has both feet planted very firmly on the ground of evidence-based medicine, like a moderate in that regard. But I'm very hopeful about what humanity can accomplish. So I figure over my lifespan, if I can do some things now, either on my own or as part of a larger enterprise, I mean, you, you asked what, you know, what the future brings? I have no clue. So whether I do things as this kind of intre uh, alone thinker or as part of another enterprise, or perhaps both, like right now I'm still working part-time and I'm managing this, um, but I'm very passionate. And as you can see from my, all the degrees and things I've, I've done, I've always been just a high, a high moonshot type of person. And, and the excitement for me is I discovering what those next moonshots will be. Yeah. Well, I think uh, you definitely have had an impact in this space already and will continue to do so. If not, if anything, you've helped my own channel grow and I appreciate that so much. So I can only re yeah, wish you the best of luck with what comes your way next. And yeah, I hope we continue to, to keep in touch. And yeah, if there's anything else you want to say, then do so. But it's just been great to speak with you today and to hear your background and your motivation for what you do. Oh, uh, thank you, Eleanor. I, I appreciate being on what is like, um, you're, it's really unique the way you put out there. I've been, I really, like a lot of people come on to shows, Eleanor, and they're like, oh, I'm your biggest fan, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and you're like, you don't know if they really mean it. But what's cool is I, I didn't know you, and I was like putting out your stuff because I was so excited about it. And for those, they can, uh, this is being recorded today on October 13, 2023. Again, like, I'm, no. Eleanor is one of the <laughs> tiny number of people who knows who I actually, what, who I actually am and what I actually lo look like, that kind of near Barzillai, David Sinclair, hybrid David Barzillai dude, um, that I was a, extremely enthusiastic about your content from the beginning. And I think you're making an extraordinary difference. And um, with the nice thing about being, you know, I'm in a season in my, my life and career that I, I can work part-time and I have out of, out of choice. I was at some point, I was a partner in a practice so now how things work out they don't matter to they don't matter for me from a I'm not I, I don't need the like for it to work for me for my personal success from a career standpoint is what I'm trying to say this is more like a passion project so whatever comes out of it is, is good and the more more the merrier and people who have ideas feel free to reach out to me and uh, thanks thanks again for having me Eleanor it was really will be uh, one of my lifetime memories being uh, on the show with you. Oh, great. I, no, I'm really glad to hear it.